Hello, everybody. I would like to welcome you all back again to MHPN's uh, webinar. Tonight's topic is supporting the mental health of older people living in the community. Um, I would first of all uh, like uh, to welcome um, 493 participants so far. We've had 1,400 people register, so that number will climb during the evening. Um, it is also important to to say that MHPN wishes to acknowledge the, the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We, we wish to pay respect to the elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the culture and hopes of Indigenous Australia, uh, particularly on this day today, sorry day. My name is Michael Murray. Um, I'm a GP uh, from Townsville. I have a special interest in mental health, and I'm also a medical educator. We have a very uh, talented uh, panel here tonight, um, and uh, I shall go through their names. The first person I'd like to introduce is, um, is Sharon um, uh, Lee Hazel, uh, who is from the ACT. Uh, Sharon, uh, can I just ask you, um, how did you first become interested in being um, an advocate for, uh, for, for carers and for, 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 for the elderly? Um, well, Michael, I was actually a carer for my mother who had bipolar disorder. And uh, my husband's mother has Alzheimer's. Right. So, uh, you know, I have, since my mother's death, which was about uh, six years ago, I've uh, well, you have more time when you're not in a caring role. Um, and I've been able to take some of the issues that I came across uh, to various tables, uh, particularly in the ACT. So I'm a carers rep for carers ACT. I'm on uh, advisory boards and, and such. Um, and I'm also uh, now doing a PhD at the ANU on older people and chronic mental illness and their carers. And looking at services and support uh, that women they need. Great. And you find that you're being listened to and, and being respected for your opinion? Yes, right. Yes, it it, it does. Um, I think that uh, the culture is changing. Uh, I think sometimes the there was room made at the table uh, for consumers and carers, and I think now people are very used to having us at the table, and yes. so the conversations can be very very good. Right. Thank you very much for attending and, and, and agreeing to be on the panel tonight. Um, next, um, I would just like to um, introduce um, Associate Professor um, Morton Rowland. Morton, you're very welcome here tonight. Thanks, Michael. Can you just give us a brief overview of your expertise in this area, please? Um, I'm a uh, GP currently working in Melbourne. Uh, I have been a rural GP previously. Um, and uh, I'm currently the chair of the General Practice Mental Health Standards Collaborative and on the MHPN board. Um, I have particular interest in mental health and uh, uh, particularly around uh, keeping uh, people within their communities and working within the community uh, for their mental health. Uh, uh, I have an interest in aged care. I visit uh, uh, six different uh, aged care facilities uh, around my local area and um, provide that sort of service also. Um, so, yeah. That's in great, Morton. Thank you very much. You sound like a very well-rounded uh, GP and educator. Thank you very much. Thanks. And next I'd like to introduce uh, Judy Bajic. Um, Judy is a psychologist who joins us uh, from New South Wales. Uh, Julie, can you give us an overview of um, of your expertise in this area, please? Good evening, Michael. Yes, um, my name is Julie. I'm a psychologist in private practice in Sydney. I am also um, completing a PhD looking at the impact of mental health in older people on the aged care workforce. Um, I visit 48 facilities in Sydney, Central Coast and Newcastle. And, and I work particularly with people who are transitioning from independent living, um, moving into supported accommodation. I also um, chair the New South Wales Psychology and Ageing Interest Group through Australian Psychological Society. Could you explain the organisation WiseCare to us briefly, please? Oh, yes. Um, 
So I have a team of psychologists who uh, who support me in delivering treatment um, to older people who move into care. So what we tend, what we do is um, we we run wellness programs as part of the admission into residential care. Um, in my experience, I found that it's not just about treating the individual and their and their transition. It is also about supporting the families, educating staff, um, and, and and supporting the wider community. So taking so the help. We, the healthy yes. home model rather than the illness model. That's right. That's right. Yes. Right. That's really good. Thanks very much, Julie. And last Thanks but much. certainly not least, I'd like to welcome Henry Brody, a psychiatrist in New South Wales. Hello, Henry. You're very welcome. Can you can you tell us how you first became interested in um, aged um, uh, psychiatry? Oh, I I became involved in setting up what's now Alzheimer's Australia. Uh, first in New South Wales and then nationally and then internationally. Uh, and uh, I moved full time into psychogeriatrics in 1990. So currently I work at the Prince of Wales Hospital in Sydney as a psychogeriatrician and I head up a memory disorders clinic. And I spend probably a bit more than half my time at the University of New South Wales where I'm a professor of uh, ageing and mental health and also director of the Dementia Collaborative Research Centre and co-director of the Centre for Healthy Brain Ageing. Um, I'm also involved with the International Psychogeriatric Association, where I'm the current president. I see patients, uh, adult patients. I go to people's homes and I go to nursing homes. And I, I used to look after inpatients as well, but I've stopped doing that lately. That's great, Henry. Um, you, you sound like a very, very, very well-rounded psychiatrist. Um, um, thank you. <laughs> what do you prefer doing the most? I quite like the home visits. I mean, I like the research a lot, and that's where I've really put my energies in. I've, I, I used to be director of our um, department at the hospital, but um, I stood down from that about two or three years ago and have moved full time in university with a conjoint hospital appointment. So I love the research, but I, I would not like to give up seeing patients. And um, since I gave up being the director of the department, I've had time to go and do home visits, which I, I think really leads a whole new dimension of seeing what happens with people. Um, you get quite different view from having them come into your consulting room. Yes, yes, it is, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you very much. And now we have a poll that's running uh, this evening. We now we have 622 22, um, participants on board. Um, out of 1,400, we expect the other 800 to catch up. I did notice that um, that uh, somebody had written that uh, if MHPN had been in the Eurovision Song Concert test, <laughs> we would have gotten um, 12 votes. So can you all quickly vote and just show us where you are coming from? Um, it will be inter interesting to see if we have anybody internationally. If there's one. Good. So that gives us a fair breakdown so far. Um, right. OK. So we're running about uh, two to one uh, between metro and regional. Uh, and uh, probably the rural would make up and make that even Stephen really, with that one international person still hanging in there. Um, we might just close that poll now and move on with tonight's presentation. And we will just move firstly to, um, to Sharon. But first, I'll just go over the ground rules. Uh, just remember that when you are, when you are posting, um, uh, all attendees be respectful of other participants and panelists and behave as if, as if this were a face-to-face -face activity. Post your comments and questions for, panel, for panelists in the general chat box. If you get into trouble and you need help for technical issues, go into the technical help chat box. Uh, and please um, keep all the comments on topic if you can. Uh, if you'd like to hide the chat, remember you can click the small down arrow at the top of the chat, of the chat box. Your feedback is extremely important to MHPN. And at the end of the session, I will remind you of that again. And there is a short exit, exit survey, which will appear as a pop-up when you exit the webinar. And now, as we head um, 
uh, towards um, our first speaker. We have 640 people online. So the NA outcomes for tonight are three, and through an exploration of Eddie's experience, you will have had um, Eddie's um, uh, story. The webinar will provide participants with the opportunity to firstly recognize the key principles of the featured disciplines approach in screening and assessing the mental health of older people living in the community. Secondly, understand how different practitioners can intervene to support older people living in the community, thereby improving mental health outcomes. And lastly, to identify challenges to and opportunities for collaboration that may emerge as practitioners from different disciplines working together. To achieve the first learning outcome, we'll move to the first part of our presentation. And um, we, would let, we will now hear from Sharon. Uh, thanks, Michael. Um, the first thing that I um, really picked up from the scenario was that Tom wasn't aware, I think, that he was a carer for quite some time. Uh, so early in the story, you could see that in the scenario that Eddie had been a manager before his retirement. He'd been active in the community after his retirement uh, with his wife, Mary. And it wasn't until around Mary's illness and death that he started to show some signs. Um, but this might not have been picked up by his immediate family straight away. And so, and at the same time, uh, his son and daughters um, and, and our other family would also be grieving the loss of Mary as well. And so they'd be also going through their own issues around that time. So, uh, so that brings me to the carers don't always know they are carers and also changes in the older person go undetected by the family. And it isn't until sometimes the matters have become quite serious that the family really starts to understand what's going on. And this is mainly because the person has been independent uh, potentially for quite some time. Uh, they are the parent in this case. And so you've got that parent-child relationship. And it takes a while for, for older adult children to take on, uh, on their parents uh, like a responsibility to ask them what's going on. And, um, and so you can see in this scenario too uh, that Tom was fearful of, um, of ridicule or, or, um, or making his father angry or upset by posing some probably useful questions to his dad. And so uh, there's a potential for conflict then between the older person and the carer. And, but there's also that uh, conflict, that uh, potential there for conflict between uh, in this case, Tom and his sisters, um, because the sisters aren't living, not that this has come up much in the scenario, but the sisters are living away from that area, don't see their father regularly. And so sometimes uh, the older person can put on quite a different um, uh, uh, persona on the phone to their other um, children. And so there is that potential for conflict. And also between the care and the medical teams, and uh, um, and I'll talk about a bit more about this soon. So, what does the older person with a mental health uh, condition need? And from my experience, they really need that uh, sense of dignity and, and control over the situation. Uh, they are feeling confused anyway. Um, if they if they are having uh, if, uh, maybe they're depressed or anxious or, they're, or maybe they uh, do have um, uh, sign, early signs of dementia. And, uh, but they still want to keep their independence for quite some time. So access to services and support is really uh, essential, uh, that they have the, the right physical and mental health services uh, that they need, home and personal care, disability aid, uh, that they still have some social outlets and that their housing is adequate for their needs as well. But sometimes um, I've found that uh, old persons underestimate their needs to their family uh, because they either don't want to be a burden or they, um, and they want to retain their independence. I think we can all understand that too, that they, they have been their own person for a long time, maybe 70, 80 years. 
and uh, and so it, it is a difficult time for them. But there is also a burden for the carer. Um, first of all, as we can see in the scenario with uh, Tom, he would have had um, also his own stresses, uh, certainly emotional, as he saw his father um, deteriorate but perhaps also financial. And this can uh, happen if the carer has to spend more time uh, uh, looking after uh, the older person, maybe skipping work, um, or they need to go to work so they're worried about not being with the person they're caring with. Um, and so their mental health can also um, suffer as a result. And the other thing that um, is apparent, I think, in this scenario too, is carers don't always know what questions to ask, either of the person that they're caring for or of the medical profession. And so sometimes it, it takes them a while to, to uh, really get around to the questions they want to ask. And, and it's great when uh, the health professionals can step in and anticipate what they need to know. Oh, I just clicked the wrong thing. So, so what does the carer need? They need to be aware of their rights and responsibilities. And they also need to have a sense of control and understanding of the situation. This can come about with some, uh, perhaps some education um, and discussions with uh, teams and support groups. Um, there needs to be appropriate and open communication between the uh, older person that they're caring for, the rest of the family, and also uh, with the health professionals. And it'd be great when, if the health professionals can also assess the care and need, work out who the carer is, um, and this might be that the consumer will um, uh, uh, tell the health professional who they think their carer is, um, or it might be just quite apparent from the situation. Um, they probably or possibly need financial support and uh, and they need to know, sometimes they don't know if they haven't been a carer before, that there are organisations uh, that can help them, uh, that can provide counselling. And so some final things I got from this scenario too that, that, that I consider a real issue is around discharge planning. Um, this can be a very stressful, uh, stressful time uh, for the person and the, uh, older person and the family uh, if it's not done correctly. And I think it should start uh, from when a person's first admitted to hospital. And uh, and in this case too, um, this brings me to the physical versus mental health care. Uh, because Eddie was actually um, admitted for a physical illness, he was only in there for three days. But it doesn't look like um, in the discharge plan or during his hospital stay, perhaps uh, he didn't have the mental health assessment that he needed. And I often found that um, with my own mother, if uh, she went into hospital with a physical um, ailment, that her and mum had clear mental health issues with her bipolar disorder, that they were treated rather separately. And this wasn't always helpful on discharge. The other thing too is the impact of change on the older person. And so, you know, there, there might be the changes in medication. Um, they might have to experience that. They might have injuries like Eddie did, illness, grief, loss. This all seems to uh, really affect my mother and other older people that I've known. Um, and it's sometimes very hard, I found, for the family or the, or the uh, health professionals that we talked with to really know what was the cause for some of um, what were quite um, depressive um, signs or uh, anxiety. And so uh, it's, it's quite a tangled web that... Um, that has to be worked out. So I think I'll leave it there because there's a lot of um, lot more to be said. And so Michael, back to you. Thank you very much, Sharon. I am, I'm, I'm very much looking forward 
uh, to your PhD, and um, we'll, I'm sure you'll be coming back to MHPN as a as a as a proper doctor rather than us. Thank you, um, <laughs> bachelor doctors. And now we'll we'll move on to um, to Morton uh, Morton's presentation from the general practice per perspective. Thanks, Michael, um, and thanks, Sharon. That was a really good uh, uh, summary and start off. Um, I guess uh, the main things that I wanted to bring up was what the GP can bring to this uh, process. Um, essentially, the GP should be in the position to uh, be the coordinator of the information and the primary point of contact, both for the patient primarily, uh, but also for the family as well. Uh, the number of times that uh, I get information from family members and uh, uh, relatives of, um, and friends for that matter, uh, about individuals uh, and their concerns, um, the difficulty is what can you actually do with that? Um, and we might touch on that a bit later. Um, the, it is important for somebody to be able to try to facilitate the discussion between the patient and the family. Um, the, the patient may not need, know how to start that conversation. The family may not know, know how to start that conversation. They may still be grieving over uh, uh, their mother's loss. and. Um, now this, all these other things are being brought up uh, after the admission to hospital. Um, all of these things uh, make life difficult for the family and also the patient. Um, it's really important for the GPs to also remember that we are actually dealing with a family um, and that's not always easy. Um, at the bottom of it, we as GPs need to try and exclude and classify the various medical issues that might be going on with this patient. Um, not everybody who is confused is depressed. Not everybody who is confused has a brain tumour or things like that. We need to sort out what is uh, happening. Um, the number of people who I have seen who've had long-term battles with uh, being depressed and turn out to have things like hypothyroidism and things like that which come on very slowly um, and are easily missed if you don't keep them in mind and keep looking for them. Um, in terms of the medical issues and uh, often with the mental health issues as well, the GP is often the person who needs to commence the treatments of various types um, and that may be with counselling uh, or it may be medication um, and that may be in, associated, in association with other services um, whether that be in the mental health arena or in the more physical arena. Um, and sometimes we actually end up being the advocate uh, for those patients into the health system. Um, again, the number of times that uh, uh, you have to ring um, to facilitate an appointment, particularly in the situation of older people because it is very hard for them to sometimes negotiate through the switchboards of public hospitals, then the outpatient departments, then trying to speak to uh, the admitting people and then trying to speak to, uh, the list goes on and um, sometimes they do need somebody to cut through the red tape and most GPs will do that if at all possible. Um, if, and this is another big if, if the patients 
tell them that they're having difficulty. Um, we aren't mind readers, so you can sometimes assume, um, but it's better to work with the person um, and uh, to help them to come to terms with what needs to happen um, and also what can happen for them. Um, on occasions, uh, the other part of our advocacy role is to try and break down some of the barriers. Um, you know, one side of the family is not talking to the other side uh, or uh, a friendship has broken down over the back fence or something like that and uh, we sometimes have to get involved in that as well. Um, Similarly, you know, it does take a bit to uh, work through what might in fact be going on with this uh, person. Um, it is not only uh, some of the big things, but you know, in my experience it can also be big things to them which may seem small to us. You know, uh, you know the fact that their cat is sick or um, they are no longer able to uh, afford uh, going to the club or something like that. All of these things are, are matters that we have to uh, look at and keep in, keep in mind. Um, all of this is on the basis of a legal background and there are obviously some definite legalities uh, that you need to uh, keep in mind there are privacy issues, uh, confidentiality issues and in amongst all of that is trying to weigh up the line between what is safe for the patient uh, to stay at home when they wish to um, and when, it be, when is the time when it's no longer safe and they're putting themselves at risk and that's a very hard conversation that uh, we sometimes have to have. We can't force them to, to leave their homes um, and we have to try and assist them. But the, you actually almost have to be the, um, the voice of reason in some times like this. Um, and it is also important that we appropriately discuss um, matters with the other carers, um, the other professionals who are involved, uh, as well as the individual. So I'll um, stop at that point. Uh, there's lots more to be said. Uh, Thanks but very much, Morton. We'll, we'll have the panel discussion shortly and we'll be able to um, to, uh, to go into all those flags that you've mentioned. Thanks very much. That was a really, really good presentation. Yeah. We'll now move on to Julie Bajic's uh, presentation. Um, Julie, our psychologist. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, firstly, uh, what I'd like to do is define what is depression and how is it different in older people. Um, what we know is that depression presents in four different types of symptoms. We've got feeling symptoms physical, behavioural and thinking. With older people, um, they tend to present with more physical symptoms as opposed to younger people. Um, with the feeling symptoms, they might become irritable, which Eddie appears to be, overwhelmed, lacking confidence and reports of anxiety. In terms of physical symptoms, it could be appetite changes, which we've noted through um, his um, decreased appetite, weight loss, reports of pain and uh, multiple physical symptoms. So in my experience, I've, I've seen a number of people who are depressed who are more comfortable saying that they have pain rather than they feel depressed. Um, behaviourally, they're not usually they're doing the usually enjoyable activities. They're slowing down in movement. And they're thinking, um, they, they tend to have memory problems, negative thinking patterns, which can lead to suicidal ideation. Um, it is important to note that depression is essentially the same disorder across the lifespan. It's not just that with older people, it tends to present differently um, than in younger people. Um, overall, older people tend to um, describe sadness a lot less 
than younger people and it can be difficult for older people to accept the diagnosis of depression. Um, when we look at um, the risk factors, uh, it is important to note that age itself is not a risk factor. However, risks um, increase with social isolation. Um, and isolation is a big, big issue, not only for people um, who live rurally, but also in metropolitan areas. Um, a number of clients I see particularly who receive home and care uh, packages. The home care worker might be the only person they speak with that, that day or that week. Grief and loss, so accumulation of losses. So I know Eddie um, is grieving the loss of his wife. Um, also loss of identity and, and loss of purpose. Changes in living arrangements, uh, chronic illness, chronic pain, as well as um, looking at the possibility of dementia. What we touched on briefly before were the barriers and risks that people are prepared to, um, to uh, the families prepared to tolerate at this time for their loved one. Certainly the risk of uh, malnutrition, the risk of safety, um, and, and barriers to treatment become an issue. In relation to um, looking at it from a psychological perspective, um, it's really important to note that depression in older people in the community is estimated to be between 10 and 30 percent, um, as opposed to general population, which is about 15 percent. So older people are twice as likely than general population to develop depressive symptoms. Um, in residential care, it tends to go up to 50 percent. In, in relation to screening for dementia, which Henry will touch on after me, um, it's really important to get the baseline, and baseline means to assess what was Eddie like before his wife's death? What was he like before um, he had a fall? What was his life like when he was bird watching and engaging in activities? It can be particularly difficult in identifying depression and dementia, and we know that people who, who have early signs of Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia are at greatest risk and have the most disabling depression. And that is particularly if they have insight into the illness and they know what, what is ahead for them. Older men um, aged 85 plus have the highest rates of suicide in the population. And that's really surprising for a lot of people because they anticipate that would be in younger age groups. Um, so we're not talking about the, the numbers, we're talking about the rates. So men aged 85 plus um, are the highest risk, followed by men aged 80 to 84. This was published by Australian Bureau of Statistics last year. Um, in this stage, um, it, it makes sense to look at, well, what is happening? Why are older people not accessing mental health support? And why, why do we have such a high prevalence of suicide? And, and the answer comes down to the fact that less than 25% of older people access mental health support at some stage in their life, which is, um, which is alarming given that in general population it's more than 50%. So what, what tends to happen, in particularly in my private practice, is that I would get a referral for, for a person and I would um, see on the referral that they have depression and, and that would be identified by, by the GP and the family, but the older person themselves might not think that they are depressed or they might feel stigma associated with a label of mental illness. Um, so there are a number of barriers to treatment. It could be the client, it could be the family. The family might say we do not wish for, for our loved one to receive mental health service um, support. They might not see that as a barrier. It could be a GP as well. The GP might not perceive that um, psychological support is required for the person as well as the access to service. So there aren't many psychologists who, who work with older population um, or specialise in working with older population. So what I'm doing at the moment is supervising a group of students through Macquarie University and training them to work with older people, particularly in aged care. Um, here are a number of screening tools used for depression in older people. These are often administered by, by GPs or also by psychologists as well as aged care facilities. In my experience, I have not noted them administered by home care service providers. And in, certainly through my PhD research, I, I've, um, I, I've, I have learned that um, mental health is not routinely screened in clients receiving home and community services. I'm not saying that it is a role of home and community service um, providers to treat mental health, but I think it's important for them to note any changes and to escalate it with the GP appropriately. So we've got a number of tools here which are specifically um, designed for older people, which include the geriatric depression scale, 
Um, these are, this is a self-administered 30 item scale. Geriatric anxiety inventory, which was developed in Australia in 2007. The Cornell scale for depression and dementia, which is used predominantly in residential care, as well as the brief assessment schedule um, depression cards. So based on, based on these um, screening tools, based on the clinical presentation, um, the client might um, discuss with, the, with their GP or the family. That is usually when my services would become um, involved. In terms of treatment, um, we know that older people respond all well to, to psychotherapy. I certainly would expect Eddie would respond well to it. Um, and we found that our research shows that the best treatment is combination of physical activity and um, cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, we also know that interpersonal therapy is another type of intervention for older people and that psychosocial interventions can improve well-being and can be effective for depression in older people. Um, that's all I had to say at this stage. I am conscious of time and I'll be quite happy to pass it on to Henry. Thank you very much, uh, Judy. That, that was an, uh, a very succinct and, and but very, very complete overview of uh, Eddie's case. And I have been asked um, by um, the webinar um, um, Hi Honcho just to ask you to stop moving around so much. Um, okay. You're you're so much into your presentation that with the small screen. You do bob around a little bit, but um, okay. please don't let that cramp your style. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, and now we'll just move on to Henry, uh, Professor Henry Brodity. Uh Thanks very much, Michael, and thanks, Julie, for that uh, summary. That's really good. So um, if we just review any symptoms of depression, uh, and these fit into the categories that uh, we just heard about. He's irritable, he's complaining, he's lost interest. He's withdrawn socially, he's not eating his meals, his dog is neglected, and in hospital he was restless at night and agitated. Um, when I'm seeing someone with depression, the first thing I want to know is, is this the first onset or is this a late onset? Because if it's early onset, and we find that out by looking at past psychiatric history, if there's a family history of psychiatric illness, it's more likely to come on early. And I particularly always ask about an alcohol and drug history. But if this is the first onset, if Eddie's never had a depression before, then I think, well, could this be an organic cause? Could there be something physically going on with him? And as Julie's explained, um, neurological disorders have very high rates of depression associated with it. So Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, vascular dementia, stroke, um, Anyone who's got any neurological condition affecting the brain is at a high risk for depression, maybe up to 50%, uh, say in Parkinson's. But there are other things, which some of which are treatable, and some of which the depression won't get better unless the physical cause is um, addressed first. Things like having a tumor. It could be a tumor in the brain, but it can be a non-metastatic manifestation of tumor somewhere else in the body. A classic example in textbooks is uh, cancer of the head of the pancreas. So that uh, people may have the depression a year before the uh, tumor is recognized. I had a patient who had hypercalcemia due to a parathyroid tumor. And he'd had a year or two of treatment before we found his, high, his calcium was high, found it was caused by the parathyroid, removed the parathyroid, calcium came down, and he responded then to uh, treatment for his depression. Less commonly, low B12 levels or some infection can be an occult infection, hypothyroidism. And you can get depression as a side effect of drugs. Uh, moving on, so when I'm seeing a patient uh, with depression, I, I use this framework. I use, the, I use it to derive an etiological map. What is the cause of this person's depression now? And uh, so I think of what's happening in the biological sphere, and I've gone through that, the psychological, the interpersonal, and the social environmental. So if you look at Eddie, you start from the inside out, as it were, the biological things. He's got pain. He's had a fall and question head injury, but the scans have been negative. But still, there may be a late sequelae of that. Is this a medication he's taking? Um, is this an early dementia that hasn't been diagnosed? Uh, could it be secondary to one of the physical causes I mentioned? I guess most prominent and most obvious in Eddie's case is his grief. 
I mean, he's, he's angry and maybe even feels guilty about his wife having gone into hospital and his loneliness. Uh, in the interpersonal domain, he's, he's lost support. He hasn't got his partner. His daughter's in Adelaide. Tom's there. But he doesn't have much in the way of support, particularly as he's withdrawn. And in the social environmental, he doesn't seem to have a role in life. He's withdrawn socially. He doesn't have any purpose. So what I would do it would be to get a history. I get it from the daughters. And I've said, ah, there should be sister-in-law there. Um, I'd like to know more about his relationship with his wife, because we know if relationships were conflicted before death, the grief is always more complicated. Was he dependent on her? What, what, what was going on beforehand? He clearly needs to have a physical examination and a cognitive examination. Remembering the midi mental states, that's it's a reasonable test, but it doesn't do well for frontal lobe function. And so as a minimum, I do a clock drawing test as well, ask them to put in the hands, and the, 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 sorry, the hours, the numbers for the hours, and then put in the hands for something like 10 past 11 or 20 past 5. I check his weight. Looks like he might be losing weight. I do some basic investigations as listed on that slide. And importantly, this man is at risk of suicide. It's just been highlighted. Older men with depression, we really worry. Has he had thoughts of death? Is he drinking more? Um, has, has he thought about how to end it all? Religious practice can sometimes be a saviour, can, can be some sort of safety against it. It's certainly not an absolute safety, but we should ask about that. If I'm the new person coming in for his treatment, I need to build a relationship with Eddie, explore his feelings, and of course deal with the pain which has been spoken about. One of the, the common conundrums is, is this depression or is this dementia? I only allowed one slide for this, but I could have had three slides. So just looking at the two, the left is depression and the right is dementia. So the, the, the course of the, the symptoms in depression, it's usually weeks, rarely months, in de or less commonly months. In dementia, it's mostly years, and sometimes months, unless it's sudden onset, like after a stroke. The memory problems in depression are more patchy and may be um, linked to emotional content, whereas in dementia, it's more short-term memory. Concentration can be down in both, but more so in depression. Past history of psychiatric illness is a really good clue. And um, the, um, the mood um, in someone with depression is pretty pervasive. And it, doesn't, it may have an early morning awakening, maybe a sort of a diurnal mood variation, and worse in the morning. But it's more variable in dementia. There are vegetative features of depression, early morning awakening, diurnal mood variation, loss of weight, loss of appetite. Um, and in dementia or any organic brain syndrome, people tend to get more confused in the evening. We should do cognitive testing, and the person with depression will give up easily. I can't do it. I'm losing my, my, my thoughts, my brain. The person with dementia often delights if they get tests right. But there's a trap. People can have both depression and dementia. About 20% of people with Alzheimer's also have a depression. So let's go to management. This has to be a partnership. It has to be the GP the community services, uh, the family, and at the center of it all, of course, is the patient. Timing's important. Now, I don't think we can do much with Eddie unless he's had time to ventilate and deal with his grief. He's not going to re-engage with his bird watchers or his friends or doing his activities until we do that. The easiest thing is to reach for the antidepressants, but this is not the first line of treatment, and that should be kept in reserve if things are, other things aren't happening. So let's look at this etiological map and now put a management map. So we start with the biological. We're relieving the pain, correct anything that's abnormal, certainly worry about his nutrition, keep the antidepressants on, in our back pocket ready for use. Grief counseling, as I said, is really the mainstay at the beginning, I think, and more support for him. Um, perhaps link him up with. Um, uh, we should link him up with some more supports in his interpersonal life. I, I sort of changed that there, sorry. And in the social environmental sphere, more community support, uh, making sure he's eating, uh, somebody coming around to check on him, using the community nurse if it's available, collaborating with a sister-in-law, not the aunt, sorry, and really looking at a stepwise re-engagement and perhaps even organizing a pleasurable event schedule, this is the sort of thing Julie would do, 
But yeah, you start off with a very simple activity that you know he'd like, and have maybe half a dozen activities that he agrees that he used to like when he was well, and then start at the easiest and build up gradually. And uh, that's the end of my, my session. Thank you very much. Henry, that was, um, uh, as many of the um, uh, attendees have said, that um, they, they just love uh, going to your, uh, uh, listening to your talks. And that's the first uh, talk I've heard of yours. And it was absolutely excellent. Uh, I, I learned so much from it. And, and I'm amazed that you got through it in, in seven or eight minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> Um, now we come to the uh, second part of, of our presentation, where we this was collaboration um, as a panel, and we do have some questions that we want to ask each other on the panel. And Morton, I'll ask you to direct that question we discussed earlier you, for Sharon in relation to family dynamics. Would you would you be able to discuss that with Sharon now? Yeah, sure. Um, Sharon, it's clear that. Uh, families are really important in this process. How how can we best approach families? Um, who is the best person to take the lead in that um, when the patient is clearly in trouble um, and not sure where to turn? Is there any rules that are that are needed in here? I think it's really useful to ask the uh, older person who they think their carer is, or if they have anybody that supports them. Because yeah. I speak to a lot of carers, and they'll say, "Oh, but the person I care for, they don't think I'm their carer." Um, so it's very useful to hear what they have to say. If they don't think they have a carer, and the, and again, carer is a silly sort of word <laughs> when it comes to family. Um, it might be just, um, have you got anybody that supports you? Have you got anyone that you um, see every week? And and that way you can find out from them. I then see if um, if you can say to the uh, ask the older person if you can actually talk to the the carer. Um, and and this starts that communication that's really very very useful um, in the family. Sometimes it's thrown at you if they're in hospital, um, as a carer and a family. Um, it's usually the person who the, the health professionals see. Um, and uh, so that becomes you're the carer. But it's not necessarily always the case. Uh, sometimes the person as the main support for the person might just not be at the hospital or might, might not be available at that time. So it's really very, very useful to um, to start the conversation, I think, with the older person. If they're confused or, um, uh, in my mother's case, at one point she was quite psychotic. So, um, you know, it's really about uh, them being able to talk to uh, the people that are there and uh, some of the information that was mentioned tonight, uh, uh, particularly by... Um, uh, Henry was is, was superb to be able to actually um, work out what is wrong with the person and perhaps ask what their history is. Um, the uh, bit about the um, what religion they had resonated with me because there were some assumptions made, for example, with my mother uh, that she was a fundamentalist Christian and she wasn't. So unless you get that information from the family, um, it can actually help with, um, I think, the health professionals being able to better diagnose what's going on. Thank you very much, right. both of you. Um, we did have a question, a number of questions that came up, but one, one in particular caught my eye earlier on from Edward Reed, and, and he was, um, uh, I'd just like the panel's opinion on this, patient autonomy versus what we as health professionals feel the patient needs. Could I, could I address that to Henry first, and then we'll... we'll Will uh, the panel can then jump in after that? Yeah, uh, this is a really tough one. Uh, autonomy versus beneficence. Beneficence doing what's beneficial for the patient. So, um, and I work a lot in the field of dementia, so we're always considering this. You know, sometimes, you know, has the patient lost the capacity to make decisions for themselves, or are they irrational in their thinking, so they're a danger to themselves? 
this can be really tough and uh, there's no clear line here. It's a matter of clinical judgment and uh, also talking to the patient and the family. Sometimes it, it is black and white. You know, if they're suicidal, if they've stopped eating and drinking, um, if they're not able to care for themselves and the house is squalid, then you have more, um, more authority to take charge. But you, or there's always a legal framework. We can't take a person's rights away from them without going through a legal framework. So in the mental health arena, we go through, in New South Wales, the Mental Health Tribunal, um, or if the person is mentally impaired with dementia, say, then we go through the guardianship tribunal. So there's always a legal framework. Unless there's a, an urgency about the thing, then you have a duty of care to take over. Thank you, Henry. Julie, can I ask your uh, opinion on, on, on this? Yeah, sure. Look, I, I agree with Henry, and it, it comes up to you know individual's preference. You, you can't force an individual to engage in services if clearly they don't want to. Um, and, and therefore, that's why the interdisciplinary approach is so important. So I think for the case of Eddie, um, looking at other ways that he could connect with people and, and, and keep his um, isolation to a minimum would be a way to, to get him, you know, obviously, um, first of all, engaged and, and make sure that he eats properly and that he's, you know, um, taking dog for a walk and, and doing things before we look at um, any um, behavioural or um, therapeutic interventions. Thank you very much. Morton? Yeah, look, I, I would uh, say that it's a really good framework uh, that's been discussed. I think one of the other challenges is, and from Eddie's perspective, he's actually got quite a supportive family that's involved with him. Uh, on the other side of the coin, and I see this from time to time, there are some uh, older people who are very much on their own uh, with very little in the way of social support, even though they have relatives close by. And um, one of the difficulties that I've found in the past is how do you engage the family who for one reason or another, um, don't want to engage in the process of helping their elderly relative, um, even if that elderly relative actually wants help. Um, so that's, a, that's another side of the coin that uh, we need to deal with sometimes, and it's not easy. Thanks, Morton. Sharon, I'm sure you would have um, some opinions on this. Yes, look, it can be really hard um, uh, for the family and, and the older consumer. It can be a very confusing time for everybody. Uh, but um, when the um, older consumer might need to be, for example, discharged from hospital, um, and you're, you can get varying um, uh, advice from different health professionals, which is the best um, pathway for the person to return home. And maybe that's something like uh, rehabilitation or something that they might need to, um, so that their physical health can actually improve enough um, might not be available. And so returning home is unsafe. Living with the relatives might be um, because of family history and um, because of, and family dynamics may be impossible to actually be able to live with the family. Um, and so residential aged care can be an, uh, you know, um, an option. It's a, it's a difficult time. It's a difficult time to be able to um, resolve what is best for the older consumer and for the family. Thanks very much, Sharon. One of the one of the things that impressed me about his story was his anger, um, and Elena de Yakimo, one of our participants, um, brought up the in her comments um, brought up uh, the anger towards the med towards the treating staff. I mean, how do we how do we deal with that anger apart from from interrogating it, it what's causing it? How do we actually deal with it? Julie, starting off with you, do you have any thoughts on that? 
Sorry, can you repeat the question, Michael? Um, when uh, when a, a patient or a client like Eddie is extremely angry towards medical staff, towards uh, carers, towards people who are trying to help him, yep. apart from diagnosing him in general, mm -hmm. how does one deal with that anger when he's angry towards medical people? He may see Morton as an enemy as much as the hospital. Yes, okay. Um, that, that is very common. I think it, it needs to be acknowledged and it, it is the accumulation of, of grief and loss that they've had, you know. So it, it, it would not be um, normal to, to, you know, to say, you know, you should like all your doctors and you should like everyone, you know, and appreciate, you know, the big thing that comes up a lot for what I what I hear is that you know oh you should be appreciative that I'm doing this for you or that I'm helping you and that I'm making you you know um, fresh meals so it, anger is, is is a normal part of, of, of grieving and I think it really needs to be acknowledged and and his grief could you could you expand on that a little bit okay and and his grief the accumulation of his of his grief so obviously um, we we don't look at um, grief as, uh, as as an illness straight away. A, p a person is, you know, it's a normal part of of, of the process. It's for uh, six months for a person to grieve before they um, they would be classified as having complex grief. So it is about looking at ways to get him engaged and 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 to get him involved in activities. So um, with grief, it, it does take time, and obviously it is something that you know waking up next to his wife for you know 60 odd years and her not being there you can't say well that's normal you shouldn't feel um, you, you know you shouldn't feel grief you shouldn't miss her it is more about trying to build on new new activities and new routines that would help him through the process so could I throw open the questions of grief and anger and depression to the rest of the panel now and and, and again once they've spoken back to you Julie please yeah So, will any of the panel have any thoughts on that? Sure. Uh, Henry speaking. Um, I, I, um, I agree with Julie. Grief is a normal part of dealing with death, and uh, it's an important process to go through. We shouldn't medicalize it. It's only when it becomes incapacitating or when it prolongs beyond whatever normal is. And for some people, it's a few months, and some people, it's a year. But when it's getting beyond that, then uh, Maybe more interventions are required. Uh, generally, what we do is we get the person to talk about the person that has died and about their feelings. Um, and uh, I don't do grief counselling, but uh, there are people who are specialised in that. Morton? Yeah, look, I, I think it's, it's to me the, the main thing is actually to acknowledge that. Um, uh, they've, they've had a rough time um, and that it is okay to to feel let down um, and not to understand what what went on um, mm. if uh, I was the practitioner who actually was involved in um, uh, the difficulties with his wife and the complications that went on, um, acknowledging that you know some of the things might have been done differently uh, may be appropriate. Um, but essentially, if you are one step removed from that, and that is in fact uh, the the core part of what's keeping him in that that space. Um, Actually, starting to try and work with him about um, well, you know, let's look to make sure that the best possible care is got for you, and that you're able to move forward um, and help uh, you as a person um, to make sure that we get the most out of it for you. Generally, is is fairly successful in moving them a little bit further down the track then involving people in terms of a psychologist or uh, an, uh, another uh, appropriate counsellor um, 
and often somebody with OT skills or social work skills in that setting, depending on what's available in your local area, can be a real big bonus. Thanks very much, Morton. Now, rather than asking you to comment on that, Sharon, unfortunately, we're coming um, again towards the end of, of, of this webinar. Um, they seem to go by so quickly. So mm. I'm going to start off with you, uh, Sharon, and just to give you two minutes to sum up um, on whatever, on your presentation or on the evening or on just, just, just your thoughts in general for two minutes, and then we'll go through each one of the panel for two minutes after that. Each. Thanks, Michael. Uh, look, I've really enjoyed, this is my first webinar I've been involved with, and uh, so I've been really impressed. I've been watching some of the, the chats, even though I, I haven't really been able to, to respond to anything there. Um, I had my eye on everything, but um, what I found uh, that Henry's uh, presentation is really great for me because I've had uh, my uh, mother-in-law with Alzheimer's, my mother had bipolar disorder. And that differentiation between um, but, you know, the depression and the dementia was really very, very good. One thing I would throw in the mix um, would be around delirium um, and when is del when is uh, and psychosis. So when is a delirium a delirium and when is a psychosis um, just that and how that's treated? But that might would be for another time. Big issue with older people too, I think. Thanks very much, Sharon, and thank you very much for your contributions tonight. Now we'll move on to Morton. Just two minutes, thanks, Morton. No worries, Michael. Uh, look, the, very succinctly, I think that the, the big issue for GPs is uh, information, and certainly we want to be contacted in terms of if there are concerns, if there are things that uh, other counsellors, other people involved with our patients think we should know, um, let us know uh, so that we can help. Um, we do see ourselves as the linchpin, as the, the coordinating activator, uh, activator in this. So that's the key thing, communication uh, and letting us know where we can help. Thanks, Thanks very much, Morton. Of course, MHPN is all about collaboration, and I think um, all of the speakers this evening have 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 stressed that. And uh, uh, it's it, it, it's just I, I feel quite humbled just being here tonight. Now we'll move on to Julie. Two minutes. Thanks, Michael. Um, what I haven't had a chance to touch on yet is um, limited input that psychologists really have in gerontology due to partially um, funding. And I've noted a number of comments um, on the discussion board mm. about engaging other types of therapy, including reminiscence therapy and including um, narrative therapy. So it really depends what setting the psychologist works in, um, in private practice. If we receive a referral through better access to mental health, it has to be evidence-based psychotherapy. Um, it, it's looking at CBT, having a maximum of 10 sessions in a calendar year, even though they're looking at increasing it up to 12 as the 1st of July, so you really need to prioritise what are you what are you assisting a client with. Um, and grief and loss is a, is a, is a major part of um, what Eddie is going through. So part of that is, you know, providing psychoeducation, normalising, allowing space for grief, hope and reassurance, but also working towards establishing some goals. Um, at this stage, you know, reminiscence therapy could be beneficial, but um, I think that there are, there are other priorities that he needs to um, address at this point of time. Thanks, Michael. That's fine, Judy. I, I'd just like you to expand on that because I did notice that there were a lot of questions, a lot of comments around that. Could you just expand yep. on that, on, on, the, on the therapies available for this age group with mental so, health? Um, so the, the main ones, well, um, as I said, they, they are governed by Medicare. So when you receive a, a referral from a doctor, um, it, if it is through Medicare, it needs to be evidence-based psychotherapy. And at this stage, it's, um, it, it's predominantly cognitive behavioral therapy because older people respond to it quite well. 
Um, there's a growing trend of looking at um, reminiscence therapy. Um, there's some work certainly done um, down in Melbourne um, by Sunil Bio um, in terms of reminiscence and engaging. So with reminiscence therapy, there's two types: there's the life review um, and reminiscence therapy. So reminiscence therapy doesn't necessarily need to look at all stages of life, but engaging the person with what you know, what other happy memories, or even if they've had some challenges how they have overcome them in their life. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't fall under Medicare referral, so you would not be able to engage in that therapy under uh, a, a scheme that allows a rebate for a client. Um, reminiscence therapy has been found to be effective with people with dementia. Then again, you know, if people do enter residential care, a number of them are not eligible to, to better access to mental health rebates. So a psychologist really does have a number of barriers to treating this population um, and it really depends what, what, what setting they work in. In my experience, there's only one or two residential aged care facilities which, which employ psychologists who would have the privilege of being able to look at alternative therapies. But certainly for me as a psychologist visiting people in, in their homes, I, I, I am quite limited in terms of what, what intervention I can provide under the type of referral that I receive. Thanks very much, Julie. Henry, we'll let you sum up there. Michael. So one of, the, one of the things I didn't mention in the grief counselling is um, Eddie's angry, and his anger at the doctors uh, is something that needs to be explored as well, um, you know, losing his wife unexpectedly. And uh, I think we've touched on that, but I would emphasise it. One of the issues I haven't discussed is when should you refer? What's the threshold for referral? So most of this will be dealt with by in primary care, it won't, it won't go to specialist practice. So the issues are for referral um, is severity. So if it's at the point where the person, as I said, is not eating or drinking or is suicidal. Chronicity, so it's not getting better despite everything you're throwing at. Or risk, if the person's at an acute risk, then you, you can't wait. So they're the usual indications for referral. Or sometimes, you know, you as a GP or as a nurse in the community, um, just or the social worker has been doing the counselling. Just throw up your arms and you say, "Look, I, you know, I've really worked very hard with Eddie, but I'm not getting anywhere, and so need a second opinion." Um, so that, that's the main thing I want to say. The the other thing is that Michael, you, you told us that there's a little uh, clue in the in the uh, text here that I'll, I'll leave to you to uh, to deal with the let people know about. I, I think that's an interesting one. I, I missed it. Um, when yes, if um, if everybody goes back to Eddie's case history, sorry, I've been I've I've had the misfortune to do a a, um, a writing work, workshop recently, and I've been practicing my skills on a, MHPN, and um, I just want to a ask you all why you think um, Eddie goes to the dump once a week and what he's bringing to the dump that nobody else knows he's bringing to the dump. Um, somebody did mention earlier that it was bodies, but I don't think it is bodies. So, we've, we're, we have come uh, to the end of another um, session with MHPN. Um, I always learn lots and lots of things from, from facilitating uh, for MHPN, and, and certainly tonight has, has, has been one of those nights. Um, I would encourage uh, participants uh, who know each other to set up your own special interest networks uh, or to join an existing one in your area. Uh, remember that all of the PowerPoints and all of the um, uh, Eddie's story, if, if you have mislaid it, uh, they will all be available on the website from tomorrow. Um, and please, I would encourage collaboration uh, between all the disciplines. Uh, not just uh, the disciplines who were present tonight, but we must remember our, our, our social work colleagues, our mental health nurses, our um, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, as Julie stressed continuously, physical health is, is, um, is a major cause of, uh, of uh, psychological and mental deterioration in elderly people, or sorry, lack of physical health. Uh, the things that came through to me tonight were the, the you know, the, the normality and abnormality of grief, and, and perhaps his grief is quite abnormal at the moment. 
the problems that we all have with funding and, and who pays for these services and how do we get a guy like Eddie to access um, the proper services. Um, the element of risk is certainly there with Eddie and uh, he certainly sounds as if he's becoming uh, quite depressed with his abnormal grief. Um, the aspect of his carers and possible care of fatigue and uh, uh, possibly lack of support of, of carers is, is, um, is important. Um, I wasn't aware of reminiscence therapy and I will be um, accessing Dr. Google at the end of this session to read up about reminiscence therapy. Thank you, Julie. Um, and also, I was very interested in, in the responses uh, to how to deal with his anger, and I, I don't think there is really um, a good, a good, any one good way. And I, I, I think just being empathic. Also, the issues that arise in relation to autonomy and beneficence, um, as, as Henry so eloquently um, expanded on, you know, the, the Georgetown principles of. Uh, uh, of ethical management of, of patients and clients are, are, are quite important. And, and lastly, when to refer, when to refer to each other, when does Henry refer to a GP, when does the GP refer to a psychologist. Um, and perhaps um, in the future we will have uh, care advocates with, with, uh, with, with the expertise of Sharon whom we can, we can uh, access. Um, with the identified data to 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 get their opinions uh, as to what we should do. Um, so before um, I finish, um, I would like to invite all participants uh, to. Um, at, I think at the height we had something like 721 people on board uh, tonight. Um, I would uh, to join. I would like to ask all the all the participants to join. Uh, future MHPN webinars, um, and particularly uh, the next one, which is supporting the well-being of people experiencing a trauma response, which is on the 2nd of June. And of course, uh, details of that are available on the MHPN uh, website. Um, before I close, I, I'd like to acknowledge the consumers and carers who've lived with mental illness in the past, and those who continue to live uh, with mental illness in the present. Um, and I, I would like to sincerely thank you, everyone, uh, our, our very talented panel, and our, our very committed participants uh, for your participation this evening. Um, and I trust I will see you all again um, some evening in the future. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night, panel. Good night.